Howdy, this is Daniel Dolphin with Dolphin Horsemanship and welcome to our first episode of Pasture Pontifications. Uh, we're going to try to keep up with the Just the Tip Tuesdays and then Pasture Pontifications will be maybe bi-weekly, maybe weekly, I don't know. We'll kind of see how it goes. Uh, these are intended to be sort of a Q&A and so go ahead in any video that I've got, make a comment, ask a question and I will try to get to your question in one of these if it's the sort of thing that I can answer without uh, having to actually have a horse and, and show you. Um, so, welcome to Pasture Pontifications. Alright, we have a question and, and in none of these am I going to name the person so um, you can ask me questions, message me through Facebook, uh, email me at my website and I'll put that right here in the video. I don't want to link it in the description or something because then I'll have all kind of robot uh, trash sent to me. But, but follow that email address. You can ask me questions. I won't ever name you or anything like that so there's no shame involved. There's no feeling like it's a stupid question. Uh, a lot of, I get tons of questions and a lot of them would involve a lot of typing and so I'm trying to make this a quicker, easier way to answer those things. And, and I can answer them fully and then the you know the knowledge is out there because a lot of questions are repeated questions um, these are not going to be edited this has to kind of be streamlined and not too time consuming for me so that's pasture pontifications in a nutshell all right the first question um, and I'm not going to read the whole question because it was pretty long but it basically sums up a lady got a new horse and he is very difficult to bridle that started out with his ears specifically his left ear she seems to have gotten that uh, better but when she goes to bridle this horse she says he has a, a drastic temperament change he becomes very nervous he's uh, chomping at the bit and stuff for no apparent reason not not even being ridden he just when she bridles him he does that standing there she's even started riding him in a hackamore and he still has the same sort of behavior so so when this horse gets bridled or, or maybe even saddled would be my guess uh, there's a light switch that goes off and he's a different horse uh, she says she has ridden him in a halter and he seemed to be fine in a halter but but that act of either saddling him or putting a bridle on him causes a pretty drastic temperament change so this is solidly in the realm of a problem horse uh, it may not be a real dangerous problem or anything like that but it, it follows the same patterns that problem horses have um, and pattern is the clue this horse has an anticipatory reaction uh, there's a, a pattern a, a basically a brain pattern going on and he is anticipating something that he knows he's not going to like and thus the change the temperament light switch gets flicked and so how do we do uh, how do we deal with an animal like that? The key is in changing the pattern. So anytime we have an animal, doesn't doesn't have to deal with bridling. Anytime we've got a horse that's having a bad anticipatory reaction, could be of a million different things. We have to start him on that road and then veer off of it. And start him on that road and veer off of it. And all of a sudden... He's anticipating something, but the something he's anticipating doesn't happen. Something he didn't anticipate does. And we can begin to break that habit or that mental pattern, and we can instill a new habit or a new mental pattern. And when we break a pattern, it causes thought. Um, now I'll, I'll, I'll go off on this for just a second. A horse lacks the neocortex. Okay, and that's the basically oversimplify, but you could think of that as the outer layer of the brain. So that's why a human's brain is this big and a horse's brain is this big. So there's never going to be a situation that you get in with a horse that is going to be complex. It may seem complex to you, but something with a brain that big can't have complex thoughts. Okay, so a lot of times people will think, uh, you know that horse is planning to buck me off or, or or he wanted to get even with me for this other thing that happened okay horses are physically 
anatomically, physiologically, they lack the part of the brain that is required for those so sorts of thought processes. So they are not future or forward thinking. They are incapable of making a plan. So if your horse is giving you a problem like this, um, you're very much in the reactionary stage of the brain and you are nowhere near a forward thinking planning to give you a hard time don't want to be caught today because I don't want to ride. They're, they're not thinking about that. They're, all they feel is that there's an, an emotion, a gut reaction that says something's about to happen that I'm not going to like and thus I'm going to try to avoid it. I'm going to react in a certain way to get out of that. So any of these sorts of things, you just want to break the pattern. So with bridling a horse, I might walk up to him, let's say he's tied up or in a cross tie, maybe I'll leave the halter on him. So that's different. Normally I take the halter off, put it on the neck. That's what I do. Maybe that's not what you do. But I leave the halter on him, I walk up to him, I bridle him, I deal with all the ears, his head goes way up here, it's a nasty, ugly thing, I get the bridle on him, I take 10 steps back, I walk up to him, I unbridle him, I go walk away and I clean a stall. And he's going, huh, that's different. Normally I get bridled and then we get led out here and I ride. And that isn't what happened here. So I, I clean that stall, I come back, I bridle him up again, and he's like 80% as bad as he was the first time, that time. And then I unbridle him and I go do something else, and I come back a little while later and I do the same deal. Maybe I, um, I halfway bridle him and I leave the bit hanging under his throat latch, and again, he's got a halter on, he's secure, and, and I change the pattern, and that kind of aggravates him, but it gives him something to worry about and to think about, and it takes him out of the anticipatory what he thinks is about to happen okay so that's the key is to break the pattern um, if he's having a trial of trouble like let's say I'm riding a horse and they get really antsy with the bit maybe I stopped or something and they start playing with the bit just pick up on a rein and start asking him to flex a little or walking in a little circle and as soon as he stops messing with the bit you back off you, you leave him alone and all of a sudden um, he learns that it's making the right thing easy and the wrong thing difficult if I play a lot with the bit I get put to work if I stand here nice and quiet and I don't play with the bit then I'm left alone um, now sometimes horses are so ingrained in these patterns uh, that that we have to help them out a little bit. So this horse may be the kind that benefits from a bit that has rollers or beads or something like that on it that he can kind of play with his tongue with and sort of pacify himself. I'm not a big fan of putting those types of bits on horses that don't need it. Um, but if a horse has a little bit of a nervous mouth, sometimes if you'll just give him a little something to play with, it's kind of like chewing gum. You know, you just you got your old fixation, you get to, to chew on something and, and it kind of uh, pacifies or, or it, it, it uh, scratches that itch. You know, got a mosquito bite on my knee, I'm scratching that itch. So I'm not even consciously doing that, right? I just went to scratching it even though I'm on camera, I should be on my best behavior. Got to scratch that itch. So give him a way to do that. Biggest thing though with any problem like that could be cinchy horse, barn sour, whatever he's anticipating a certain thing happening break the pattern make something else happen you do that enough times new pattern is formed and hopefully a, a much better one that doesn't have anxiety or anything negative associated with it okay uh, another comment that's been made a few times or question that's been made is about weight on a horse's back so this is not a straightforward uh, issue. There is a deal out there about 25% of a horse's weight. That is actually meant for a horse carrying dead weight. So that applies like to pack animals and so forth. And even among pack animals, let's say we have an average string of a thousand horses. Well, one of those horses has a longer, weaker back than the rest. One of them has a short, strong back. And so Maybe one of them can, without any troubles whatsoever, carry 30% of his weight. The long, weak back horse can only carry 20 over the long term without ramifications. So the 25% rule is a guideline. 
Uh, it's not math on a calculator, and if I'm off by half of a pound, then this is a no-go. It's not, not that way. Um, people get a little bit absurd on some of these things. Uh, so I'm a decent-sized guy, and I can be with the saddle and all. I'm, you know, I can certainly be above that line of 25% for a small horse. And I'm, I'm not, I ride a lot of young horses, where I have in the past. So, so here's what practical experience has taught me. If I'm riding a young horse, and I'm a big guy, and he's maybe a smaller type of horse, we're not having long, hard rides. Um, I'm going to be a little more careful about asking that horse to really physically use himself. So there, there are plenty of super talented cutting colts that I would never ask for the kind of stop that I knew they were physically capable of giving me uh, because I didn't think they were physically developed enough yet to give me that sort of stop without some long-term damage. Uh, and I've already talked about a few things like, like I started trotting my horses to warm them up rather than loping them and that, that lowered hawk injections in uh, late two-year-olds, early three-year-olds by like 75%. That was a dramatic change. So the, the small tight circles, the repetitive stress injuries, which can be just as harmful for lunging or doing small round pin stuff, I, I want to get out of those small circles and into bigger circles as soon as I can and I kind of want to stay there and I only come back to the small circles when I have to school a horse on something that requires that and then we leave it again and physically for them that's better it's not so much a weight thing so so I'll give you an example here uh, there was a particular person that that I knew in my past that that came to ride and they were a person that said that they were highly experienced they only weigh like 130 pounds and I mean you know way smaller than me and, and they rode for a little while and soared up like three horses. <laughs> horses that I had been riding. Now I'm 100 pounds more than them. Okay. So, so the, the skill of the rider, the ability to not bounce on the horse's back, to, to roll your pelvis and, and be with the horse and you're not having uh, he zigs and I zags and that puts torque and stress on his back, those sorts of things. Um, I absolutely believe that that has a lot to do with the skill and the balance of the rider and less than the weight. I don't think it's so much a weight issue. Uh, so so a, a smaller rider that does not ride very well can absolutely soar up a horse's back um, even when they're nowhere near that 25% threshold. Okay, I think I've made my point on the weight thing. And I had one other. Okay, update on the DVD. So you may not all be aware, uh, but the bane of my life for the last two and a half years has been a DVD project called More Than a Bit of Information. And that is uh, on the bit stuff. So most of the people on YouTube that have found me found me because of the bit series. Um, and I decided to capitalize on that. So we have done a DVD. Like I say, I've spent two and a half years uh, working on it. We spent six weeks shooting the bulk of it, and then I've done reshoots up until this fall even, um, finishing all up. The project wound up being about five and a half hours long. Uh, it's a four-disc DVD set, and I've, I have thought I was at the end of this many, many times only to find out there was some sort of a technical failure and the quality wasn't as good as I wanted. Finally, I think uh, right at the end of February, I finished all of the editing, burned some masters, they're good to go, and then COVID-19 shuts down the print shops, <laughs> and I'm waiting another two and a half months here uh, to get them uh, the actual packaging and everything in hand. So. More than a bit of information, if you have been waiting on it, I think I will have the actual packaging in hand in something like a week to two weeks. Um, if you aren't familiar with that, you might go to the website and check it out. Uh, I won't do a full-blown plug, but it's, it's a pretty special project. I brought on uh, some collaborators so to test the mechanical information and make sure that everything I was telling you was correct. I have a, a highly experienced petroleum engineer actually a vice president of a major petroleum company and then a lady who's a rocket scientist uh, she she works with uh, 
major commercial airlines and turbine engines and that kind of stuff. And so my simple lever stuff is way more than vetted by two highly, highly experienced engineers. Um, on the anatomical stuff, I have two uh, equine veterinarians. So they're not just veterinarians, they specialize in equine medicine. And since the 90s, both of them have specialized only in equine dentistry. Um, they have both signed off on the project and, and, and uh, you know, asked a lot of questions of them and they've seen it and, and vetted and make sure that everything that is correct. Got a facial plastic surgeon, a dentist, two speech pathologists because I ran out of a lot of the information and a state horse specialist also with a PhD. Uh, a lot of the stuff about the tongue and the soft palate and, and the way that uh, we understand the anatomy of the horse and the physiology back there. We don't understand it as fully. Uh, so I went to some human sources. It's it's a it's been a big massive project, and it definitely takes things beyond what what I have on YouTube. There's an additional two and a half hours of of stuff in there. So everything that's on YouTube is recovered, but we've got some better examples. We've built some props. I'm 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 pretty proud of it. I think it could be a a paradigm shifting thing if it if it really gets out into the equine world and and um, and the information gets heated I think it'll make life better for a lot of horses and relationships better between a lot of people and their horses so that DVD I should have in hand ready to ship to people here pretty quick I don't anticipate any other big issues or slowdowns so fingers crossed we get that to you soon alright Daniel Dolphin with Dolphin Horsemanship Thank you much. Hope that helps. Have a blessed day.